All these Episcopalians sitting in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Basket going by. <laughs> well, the Zoom folks are from. See them, I mean, they're out there. Yeah. yeah, wherever they are, they're so laying, out there. <laughs> laying down on the on the chairs. <laughs> oh, hi, Becky. Welcome. Well, all right. <clears throat> Let's uh, go ahead. Oops, go ahead and get started here. Um, I don't know what y'all thought. I thought these four chapters were easier to read than the last two. <laughs> uh, so. Um, starts with uh, this chapter called The Gift of Imagination. Is, uh, this guy says, uh, not David Donovan, a Jesuit, your imagination is another gift from God, just like other gifts. So it can be used to experience God. And uh, I like that. It was a reminder that uh, of things that he said, at least to me throughout this book, not necessarily intentionally, but... Um, this, this experiencing God as part of prayer rather than just talking at um, or even listening. Um, but there's an experience, the experiential uh, piece to that. And so this, um, this whole chapter is on, um, you know, what, what he said, Ignatian contemplation, um, that great thing. And I don't know, I, I, my spiritual director, I've told you this before, is a Jesuit. And um, there are certain things that in, in over the course of the years that I've sat with him for the last, you know, 14 years, there are certain things that he's said to me that I said, oh, Ed said that, Ed said that, Ed said that, because it's all coming out of the spiritual, you know, they're all coming out of the emotion spiritual exercises. And, and uh, he's never encouraged me to do it, and I, you know, I, which is good because I would say, I don't have 30 days. Um, <laughs> no, you Jesuits have 30 days, you could do this. I don't have 30 days for this. Um, but anyway, I, it, was, it was good to read all of that sort of thing and, and to hear or to read where some of the things that he says, um, where, they, where they emerge. And so he begins with this. Um, uh, exercise of composing the place. And, and these are, uh, th this whole thing I think you, you will recall reading is, is based on, you're working with scripture. And um, again, not having read the spiritual exercises, he says that 
it really starts with the gospels you're to to enter into gospel stories and so you begin by composing the place and what must it have been like and and this is where the imagination comes in what must it have been like and so before he 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 gets into this the real meat of all of that um, he says it's helpful to understand the historical backdrop so it would be very different to imagine Jesus talking to his disciples on the side of the road in 2022 um, in downtown Denver than it would be, and they were walking along the way from Jericho or something like that. To understand a little bit about um, that, not only the historical uh, backdrop of the place, but the other things that were kind of going on. Um, he says, you don't have to be a biblical scholar, but if you can find something that will give you just a little bit um, of back, uh, background, that would be good. And he didn't suggest this, but you know, if you, if you don't have one, and this is an interesting practice that you would like to engage in, getting yourself a study Bible, um, a good study Bible, um, would, would be really helpful. Um, there's an Oxford study Bible, which is New Revised Standard Version. Um, I've got one that works with the um, Revised English Bible, which is a, a British translation. Um, uh, the New American Bible, there's a Catholic uh, Bible that I have um, that has a lot of background stuff in it as well. Um, you can find study Bibles. Um, they're different. Study Bibles um, are different than some other kind of annotated Bibles, and I'll talk about one in a little bit. Um, but they really provide more background. They are necessarily to lead you into prayer or into life applications in some in the ways that some other Bibles might, but I would highly suggest that. Um, then he notices the uh, notice he suggests you notice the parts of the story that appeal to you and that repel you. And uh, and to enter to, to pay attention to what repels you. That might be something that you would want to pray about. And um, those of you, a couple of you were here for um, the service, the first service in the, in the gospel lesson is the classic thing about Jesus uh, upbraiding uh, Judas, because um, Judas says, we shouldn't be using this ointment, we should spend the money on the poor. And Jesus says, no, you always got the poor. You know, that is, is a problematic passage, which is why I didn't preach on it. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's there, you know, and so th th that can be really, or another one is the Mary Martha story that repels some people. Um, and so how do you enter into those stories? So pay attention to both of those and then ask God to be with you and help you to invite Jesus into the process, not to just have him as the object of the process, but to be in the process. And then, um, so what must it have been like? So he, he says, start out with what do you see? Put yourself in this situation and ask yourself what you see. Um, what do the surroundings look like? Um, those of us, I remember when we, you know, Susan and I lived in North Carolina, there were trees everywhere. You couldn't see the surrounding for the trees, literally. Um, and she hated it because you couldn't see past the side of the road. When we moved back to California, that was great. When we moved over here, we drove through Wyoming. She said, I love Wyoming. Because you can, you can see forever. <laughs> so what the, so the, the surroundings make a difference. What can you see? What can't you see? What do you imagine? What do the people look like? Um, They're small. Smaller, perhaps. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're smaller. I mean, Jesus was about maybe at the most five foot three. Could be. Um, and we'll get to Jesus here in just a second in, in another way. But yeah, what, are the, what do they look like? Um, are they as clean as we are? You know, have they seen the dentist recently? Um, all of those things, you know. I, um, They're younger. Yeah, probably. Certainly than the folks in this room. Their lifespan was about 25, I think. What are they wearing? Not why are they wearing? What are they wearing? What kind of clothing do they have? Um, I read someplace the other day that most of us, and I don't know, maybe it was in this book, but most of us imagine Jesus wearing this sort of long gown, you know? He said, no, nah, most, this person was saying, no, nah, most of them were wearing sort of a toga, yeah. uh, shorter thing, you know? So, but all of our pictures, you know, sort of show Jesus in this long gown. Again, I'll get back to Jesus in, in a minute. 
What are the expressions on their faces? I mean, this is all entering into this story. Um, and you know, the, the downside of having a picture gone for you or having it um, animated or, or acted is that that limits your ability. Like all of us know that read books, you know, you see the movie, well, that wasn't true to the book. That's right. You know, so-and-so had black hair in the book. Why are they blonde in here? <laughs> you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and then how do I fit into that scene? Where am I? Am I an observer? Am I a participant? Am I one of these people that's having this conversation with Jesus? Or am I one of the Pharisees that's standing off to the side, just kind of going, oh, okay. Look, where are we in the story? How do we, how do we imagine ourselves? in this. Um, so that, that's one way of composing the scene. I, I put this up, which Jesus do you imagine? Yeah, the middle one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the Solomon's head of Christ. Then we've got an icon. The one, with the, the one in the center is what movie that came from, Laughing Jesus, um, or this one down in the lower uh, left that's the one that uh, artificial intelligence has sort of designed based on what we know about um, facial structure and all that kind of stuff of folks built built up off of uh, skulls and things like that from that period in that place so you know does it make a difference which jesus you're talking to and which one you which one you um identify um and uh, you know when, when Laughing Jesus came out in the 80s or late 70s, early 80s, that created an uproar. Because it was, it was way beyond, well, the Bible never says Jesus laughed. Um, you know, so can, can we think about that? Can we think about these, these kinds of things? So again, the gift of imagination. Who are you talking to? Where are you in, in all of these stories? Um, still composing the place, what do I hear? What's going on? I'll, you know, he's, he used the example of if you're there at the nativity, um, seeing our, the, the cattle are lowing, right? Uh, the sheep are bleeding, the mice are scurrying, the babe no crying, he makes, wait a minute. You know, you know does the baby cry? Do babies cry? Yes, they do. <laughs> uh, you know, what do you hear? What do you smell in a manger? What do you smell? Um, but even if you're in, walking through villages in Palestine where there's no sewage system. Yes. You know, what do you smell? What do you uh, smell? That kind of stuff. It's, 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 you know. And then what do I feel? What do I feel physically? Am I uncomfortable? Is it hot? Is it cold? Um, given where this is happening? Um, if you're on the boat with Jesus in the middle of a storm, what are you feeling? Um, very different than if you're walking one place or another. Um, what physical reactions do I have to the, is, am I tensing up? Am I relaxing? All those kinds of things help sort of compose the place um, in, in this. Going on, you know, what do I taste? Um, if Jesus made water into wine, and this wine's better than the first stuff, what are we tasting? Um, would it be uh, Chateau Lafitte? Or would it be um, Gallo? And everybody that I talk to who knows anything about wine says Gallo is better than anything they would have had. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, he talks about to enter the scene, and then he stresses over and over again, write it down. When, you're, when, you, when you've finished your experience, write it down so that you can remember what God was saying to you, what you were saying, what your experience was. And pay attention, just pay attention, enter that, enter that place um, and pay attention. Well, what if it doesn't work? I couldn't compose the scene, it was too complicated. And if you think about some of those biblical stories, if you think about the wedding at Cana, where are you entering that story? There's a wedding going on over here, the disciples are over there, Jesus and his mom are talking about the, the urn, the, the bottles of wine, the, you know, the bridegroom and the bride are off over there. They're doing something else. Um, who knows what the steward is doing? You know, I mean, there's all this stuff going on. Where do you enter a story? <clears throat> it was too complicated. Um, you all, most of you know that I'm a, a, an angler, fly angler. And um, the 
uh, advice given to what, how do you fish a really large river is you break it down into lots of small rivers. Mm -hmm. um, you forget the big river, you just break it down. And so he sort of says that in, in here to break it down into little bits, which one, which if you're thinking of wedding feast at Cana, which of those interactions is the one that you want to enter into and just focus on that rather than the whole thing. Um, I was able to compose the scene, but not a whole lot happened. Um, well, you maybe just didn't notice it. Um, you wanted it to happen quickly. It may take a few tries before you get the hang of it. So, I mean, he, he says, just keep trying, just keep trying. Um, I lost my place, I forgot what everyone says and does in the passage. <laughs> I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one was really long. Yeah. Um, I forgot to record what happened in my prayer. Uh, write it down. Again, he stressed that in that section. Write it down. Um, this assumes that your part of your prayer life is a little bit of, of journaling. And I would assume he doesn't really spell this out, but I would assume in the spiritual exercises that journaling is part of that. So that you've got something to talk about with the guy, the, the person who's leading your um, your retreat. Um, it's ignition, not igni it's ignition, not ignition contemplation. <laughs> I tried ignition contemplation and it just wouldn't start. I just <laughs> I, I've tried it many times and haven't ever ever been able to do it. I think um, you know he, he says, well, just keep trying, keep trying. Um, in, in a minute, he sort of backs off from that a little bit, and, and he, he says, well, if it doesn't work, maybe it's not for you, and go to what he calls the colloquy. And I hadn't heard of this one before. I'd certainly heard of, of um, the Ignatian exercises, but just speak directly to Mary, Jesus, or God the Father. Um, just pretend that it, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at Mary right across from me, and what kind of, what am I, what's my conversation with Mary? Um, and, and then he says, well, what am I doing for Christ? If I'm having this conversation and Jesus is across the room from me, what am I doing for Jesus? Um, to ask that question. Um, again, and that's an imagination kind of approach to this. Um, not so much a, a head game, but an imagination game. If Jesus is here. The, the proximity asks, asks a little bit more of me, I, I would say. Um, but then again, keep trying. Um, if, if any of you experienced this kind of way of, of prayer, yes, Irma? The altar of the toes. Oh. Since I came to this church, which was right after the election, Donald Trump is president, and no offense meant to anyone, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I, needed, I needed good spiritual growth. And um, I, the altar, I came at 11 p.m. And it has been a time I sign up for over midnight. And everything that this chapter deals with in imagination, I have no problem with. Hmm. Because if I can imagine Jesus praying in her proximity and even asking God, do I really have to go through with this? Do I really have to do this? <laughs> and um, and and Judas betraying him with a kiss. Um, and it's almost like Caesar saying a two per day. It was a little earlier than this, but it's you know it's um, that's not a hard imagination for me. Oh, cool! I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I always relate to the story of feeding the 5,000 five loaves of bread and two fish. As a young person, I could just accept that from my imagination that that's what happened. You know, now I got married to my wife. <laughs> 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 and uh, she's a little bit more practical. <laughs> so what, what we came up with, which, which I found was interesting in that story, was you know that really there was a lot of people there that had food, but they only had enough for their family, so they didn't want to bring it out because other people would 
they felt bad that they couldn't do it to other people. But once Jesus set the stage, they were much more comfortable with bringing it up. And it, uh, it, it, I like to use imagination occasionally. And, uh, you know, and, and from my standpoint, it just, I feel like you, you have the gift of God working through you. And, uh, and, and you imagine, I imagine, hey, if this person is healed or something. And, uh, and sometimes it comes true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? I will admit that this is not one of the ones that I've done, although I'm intrigued by it now. Um, I'm, I'm much more drawn to one of the next ones that we'll talk about. But uh, so, so the questions you know that he asks: uh, How does imagination function in your spiritual life in general, prayer life in particular? Would you change anything about it? Mark. Um, during this, I hope I'm not saying anything I should, but during this morning's sermon, we had a picture of them walking along this path in a very arid desert climate. And it struck me because it reminded me parts of Wyoming and Colorado, and just how arid it is. So the point here being that uh, to imagine yourself there, people that live out west can probably better imagine mm. what it's like in that time. How when you're out for many hours, you know, salt on your skin and have thirsty water. Yeah, actually, I, I, it was in the back of my mind when I put up, and those of you who will be at the next service will see this, I put up a map um, of, of Babylon to Jerusalem at 1,700 miles. And if the exiles are returning 1,700 miles on foot or donkey or camel, that's not getting on the Greyhound, no. you know, and, and, it's, and it's crossing Arabia. It's crossing Arabia. It's not going down the Eastern seaboard, <laughs> you know, it's not even crossing the Great Plains. Um, you know, it's 1700 miles of New Mexico. Uh, and, and, you know, so to, to put yourself into that, you know, I, I, I had to look it up. I didn't know how far it was. And so there was part of that question of how far is it from Babylon? To, um, Jerusalem. to Jerusalem and what was it going through? And you saw, you'll see, or you saw there was a red line, that was a trade route. And then there was another trade route below the two highways um, from Babylon to Jerusalem didn't go straight. So which meant that there must've been nothing in that, you know, they would have followed one of those roads, but so it would have been further than 1700 miles. But, um, anybody else imagination? My, well, whenever I'm outside, I certainly have my imagination okay. going with my garden or walking along the Willow Creek Trail, um, walking the dogs even. And I just don't have any problem moving to that realm. Okay. Others? And probably because like Jim, that was something that was a part of my life from its beginning. Okay. Because I was in Sunday school. Okay. <laughs> so I had all these stories down. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? I remember one, one night in Wyoming, I was driving home from a oil field and uh, it started snowing so hard. And uh, I couldn't see the road. I always wondered why they had those markers along the side. I, I realized why they had those markers. <laughs> the only thing I could see was those, those uh, reflecting markers. And the only thing I could do is I just said, okay, I'm gonna watch those markers, I'm gonna imagine uh, make it home and I'm gonna be in my bed tonight. And uh, and I did make it home. And that was pretty terrible experience. Mm -hmm. Um he, he talks about holding the infant Jesus. Um, those of you who may have heard me last year, it was last year going into into Advent of 2020 that. Ed, my spiritual director, suggested that I simply hold the infant Jesus <laughs> during Advent because I was trying to figure out at that point, given all of the stuff that's going on during Advent, where is the spiritual life for a pastor who's trying to deal with a congregation in COVID and the end of a stewardship campaign and all this other kind of stuff? How you know where is the spiritual life for somebody like that? He said, Just hold Jesus for a while. <laughs> you know. 
So, okay, now I know where he got that. <laughs> um, praying with sacred texts, he goes into this one. Um, and this is a little different than uh, the, the Ignatian way. It's uh, not as imaginative, uh, it, it still is, but it's not quite as in depth. Um, and this is what many people now know of as Lexio Divina. Uh, holy reading or sacred reading. Um, and it, there are, uh, as, he, as he points out, there are these four steps. The first one is you read the text, you read the story, um, and you find out what does the story say and what's going on. You're, but you're not entering into it in quite the same way. You're not becoming a part of the story. Uh, it doesn't demand that same level of, of uh, imagination. But again, he says it helps to know something about the passage. Uh, just, you know, just so you kind of think about it in the right way. Again, a good study Bible would work. And then after you kind of read the story, you say, what does it say to me? What does it say? Not only what does it say, but what does it say to me? And this is the movement from the reading to the meditation. <laughs> And he writes that God will draw you to where you are meant to go. God will draw you where you are meant to go. So there's no right or wrong. Um, you don't say, well, I really should be focusing on this passage, but I'm really drawn to this one. <laughs> um, and, and Martin would say, follow, follow the, the lead, not the, the ought or the should. Um, and, and then, so what does it say to me? Why is this passage important to me? What does it say to me? Um, thinking about, you will always have the poor with you, but I, you don't always have, what does this passage say to me? Am I way too concerned about a lot of expensive perfume? Or am I way too concerned with all of this stuff out there and not enough stuff interior? I mean, what does that say to me? How, how do we, you know, that's just, just an example. Um, and then <clears throat> what, um, what do I want to say to God? This is the prayer sign. So there's the, the, the piece of what does the text say to me? Um, but what do I want to say to God on the basis of this text? And it may be, God, help me understand, you know, um, help me be more compassionate to the poor. You know, I mean, it could be any, anything like that, just thinking about that particular. Um, and then there's some action. What difference does this text make in how I act? Um, what possibilities does it open up? What challenges does it pose? And he says, prayer is meant to move you to action. And while I don't disagree at all, that was, I don't think I'd ever seen that sort of stated so baldly um, that, that it's not just meant to make you feel good or comfortable or all of that, but it's meant to move you to some kind of action. So um, <clears throat> this, this uh, Lexio Divina, um, I, I think it, it, this is the one that speaks to me, the one that I regularly use. And um, some of you um, were around a while back when I did a, a course on appreciative inquiry. And um, one of the things that, that one practitioner has done is to take it into the individual, not, not spiritual, but into the individual um, realm. And that you, um, if, if there's a situation you imagine, or you, you appreciate what's good in that situation, and then you imagine what could be because of the goodness that's in that situation. And then you figure out how you're gonna act in accordance with what you're imagining that to be, okay? So uh, there's something good, you're in a situation where people are providing for the poor and you can imagine a better way to do it. And then you do something to do that, okay? So I apply this to, to my reading of sacred texts. So I will read a story and I'll ask or, or an account and I'll say, what works in this? What's, what can I take out of this passage? And then how can I imagine a better world based on this passage? And what am I called to do based on how I imagine that new world? 
And I didn't really recognize that I was doing this Lexio Divina thing until I started looking at Lexio Divina a little bit more closely several years ago. And then I realized that they sort of overlaid one another. And I, I felt better about it then. <laughs> I felt more holy or something. Um, but but <clears throat> there is, and I have this in my office, I meant to grab it and bring it in. Um, uh, this is a, a Bible. Um, it's the Common English Bible translation. But the, the editors have gone through and they've done Alexio Divina on various passages. And so you can open the Bible and, and to whatever passage, and there might be a Lexio Divina uh, section for it. It might be for a particular story or it might be something a little longer. So this morning's gospel is, is from the gospel of John, which is why I chose this. And so right before it gets to that chapter 12, it says this chapter, like chapter seven and eight, contains a variety of events and ideas. So here you're learning about what's going on in the text, right? It's just telling you about the text. Mary anoints Jesus for his burial, Judas objects, Leaders plot against Lazarus. Jesus enters Jerusalem. Trouble, but no, his hour has come. He proclaims that he's the human face of God. So reflect. Here's the meditation piece. Was Judas's concern reasonable? So here's meditation on that. Um, and then pray. In prayer, people learn what's important, what should remain, and what must go. Pray that you may live for Christ and for others. So how does, that, how does that come out of the story of Mary um, anointing Jesus's feet and wiping them with her hair and the conversation between Judas and Jesus about, well, you're always gonna have the poor, um, but I'm here. Where's, so, so here's a suggested prayer. Some of these work better than others for, for you. And then what are you supposed to do? Read one of the gospels and pay special attention to how Jesus acts with people. So, so this, so if you're interested in kind of do it, your, not do it yourself, but have somebody else set up the questions for you, <laughs> um, this, this, this is an option, um, you know, something like this. But here's, here's a group that took it and said, all right, this is how we'll put Lexio Divina in a study Bible, although it's not quite a study Bible because it's really focused on the sort of the, the prayer aspect rather than the, um, the details. So... Um, have any of you done Lexio? Yeah. You've done it as a group. Yeah, the, the bishop used to do that. The prior bishop, used, Bishop Rob used to do that a lot. <clears throat> it's pretty close, actually. You can wait to start the ABC with the reading. Yeah, speak up. We did it a lot in CDI, Church Development Institute, but we did a little bit different. It was three steps. What words really move you, what sentences move you, and then how does it, how can you relate to what you okay. in your current life? Mm -hmm. you know? Nadine, you said you had... I used to do it, painted it by myself. I was in EFM years <clears throat> ago. Which is Education for Ministry. Yeah, <laughs> We started doing it then, and we took it on individual practice. I really enjoyed it. Kind of. But I'm just looking at that, the book you just showed there, the lecture of the I was thinking, boy, that's just like the opposite of the Ignatian um, imaginative prayer. That's that's so structured. On, I, I, just, I enjoy where my mind goes with Lectio and what I can do with this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, the reason I, part of the reason I bought, I got the Bible was just to see what's another question that somebody may be asking of a text yes. mm -hmm. um, that I might find I can hang a sermon on or yes. something like that. <laughs> um, but what are you, I mean, he doesn't go into this, and, and I, I don't think he'll get into it in the rest of the book, but Lexio Divina has turned into a lot of other things too. Um, you can do Lexio with artwork, um, which, which, you know, it may be that you're looking at a picture of Mary washing Jesus's feet with her hair and the nard, and you're drawn to some image in that, a piece of image in that, or um, some of the larger depictions of that scene 
have all sorts of people paying attention, not paying attention to, to what's going on. And so can you say, oh, I'm not paying attention. Um, you know, great, great works, many of you know this, great works of art from the Middle Ages they'll, they're, and, and the Renaissance will have the donor, you know, in the picture off down in some corner kind of going like this, you know. <laughs> so they got in the picture, but they weren't paying attention, at least according to the artist. Uh, you know, so, so there, there's a lexia or not, a, a, there's music. You can do this with music. So it, it's, a, it's a different way of entering in to something rather than, you know, now I lay me down to sleep or a, a rote prayer kind of thing. You, that, that just made me realize that there have been times where I've done Lexio that, let me even know if I can explain this, that picking something, you know, identifying something <clears throat> in there that got my attention actually manifested as words from a song or a piece of art. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that Engineers like Lex, that would be yes. What's that? Engineers like Lex. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can understand. I, you know, I, I. It, it's my pattern, I, you know, I do this with at least two lessons a day, you know, and it takes me about 15 minutes each, each one to go through that and uh, to sit there with the text and say, I don't see anything that works in this passage. There is nothing positive in this passage. And then I have to realize, well, there are other things in appreciative inquiry, like, oh, a question may arise that's going to get me out of my skin. Um, and I've got to work on that um, or something like that. But yeah, for me, Praying with sacred texts is basically the way I do it because there's structure, there's something sort of tangible to focus on. It's not entirely free floating. Um, and um, I'm not an engineer, but but I'm, I'm a pretty strong J on the Myers Briggs, and I want things kind of, kind of, kind of structured. And and so that's um, where I find it. Um, other thoughts on praying with texts. I really like the Book of Common Prayer. And I said this before because the passages for a day are all interconnected. So the key phrases, the key words can appear. And I think our brains are reprogrammed to what we're thinking about subconsciously or maybe overtly. And when the passages fit that, then it's extremely meaningful. Hmm. I wonder, I don't, I don't think that he's got, of course, I haven't read the end of the book. I'm reading with everybody else. I haven't pre-read everything. But I, I wonder if he, if he gets into praying the year, praying the liturgical year, because that's a little bit about what you're talking about there, that rhythm of the liturgical year of Advent into Epiphany, into Lent, into Holy Week, into Easter, and I mean, there there is this rhythm, yeah, there is. and and um, I don't know if he talks about praying time, um, and what that what that means, uh, the signal of purple and what that means, and uh, green or white or red. Uh, I, I just don't know, but uh, that would be another uh, thing to to explore. And I think you're right that um, the prayer book with the lectionary and, and the and the liturgical year yeah. provides provides another uh, entree entree yeah. point. And another reason to use day by day. Yeah. You're doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So um, just in terms of time here, uh, he goes, uh, then he says finding God at the center. So now we're going from this highly imaginative thing. Um, to, to something that's pretty structured. And now we're going to, as far as I'm concerned, something that's just really sort of free flowing. <laughs> um, and uh, had any of you uh, heard of apophatic or cataphatic prayer before these great <laughs> Greek words? <laughs> uh, I did because I, yeah. Um, but I hadn't heard him for a long time. And, and I love the fact that he talked about apophatic being content light and cataphatic being content heavy prayer. And um, the engineers 
uh, among us like cataphatic prayer. Uh, and, and the uh, mystics are a little more apophatic um, in, in that regard. Um, and so he, he, what, he, what he's really talking about here is, is centering prayer, um, or at least that's what it gets called in, in sort of uh, Western Christian stuff, uh, is centering prayer. Um, and you know, there are these three steps, quiet down and move in faith and love to God, um, find a, a single word may occur, or you may have one that's the one that you use often, and just let it repeat. Peace, 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 peace. When you get distracted, got to feed the dog. Peace, 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 peace. I wish they'd put hammer in. Peace, peace. <laughs> just, there's just so much something that draws you back to, to yourself. Is is what uh, what he's um, talking about. Um, we're going on out there. Um, yeah, it's that whatever whatever's going on up there. It's not you, Mike. <laughs> um, uh, then he says that there there may be. Um, various invitations to this. You may, uh, in a hymn, a word may arise in a hymn or in a poem um, or in nature, um, which I, uh, he, we'll get to nature in a second, but I, so I was trying to think about what was he distinguishing between in terms of nature entering into centering prayer as a different from where he spends a whole chapter on nature, which we'll get to. And, and it may be going out today and you see a daffodil emerging from the snow and the word rebirth might just you know um, yeah might or or compost you know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a different a different image right? <laughs> um, and and uh, so what can happen well he says you can just enjoy being in god's presence silently um and then he, he got this little bit on, on speaking prose where somebody says, oh, I've been doing that all along. And I didn't know that just enjoying being in God's presence was prayer. Mm -hmm. um, and in the image that, you know, that he was referring to is somebody said, oh, I've been doing prose all the time. I never knew that. Um, but I will say centering prayer has never worked for me. Um, I, I, I think I, my monkey mind is too much. Um, a part of the way that, that my brain works, it just jumps around too much. And that's why I think having a scripture focus really works for me. Um, but this doesn't. Um, now, centering prayer, like I say, that's the Western, sort of a Western Christian way of, of uh, talking about it. And he mentions that this is like many Eastern practices of, of finding a mantra or something like that. And just, and, but that, has seemed to bother some people um, to talk about it in in those ways. And he, well, he says, whatever. He says, you can call it centering prayer. You can call it whatever. You, you can call it yogic meditation. Whatever. It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, I took, well, we had a class here a long time ago on contemplative prayer. And I did that for a while. I loved it. <clears throat> and it wasn't so much why you're doing it, but it's afterwards. Mm. You just, I just felt this peace. And I, I want to start doing it again. That was what Thomas Keating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I saw him talk a couple of times. And who was who was the one that kind of originated? He's passed away. Now. Basil Pennington? Who, Basil Pennington? Basil Pennington? No. Those are the two. Those are the area that was in New Mexico. Oh, my no, he, uh, he's still still alive. No, Richard Rohr is still alive. Yeah, Keating, Keating was, was was local. He was up up north of Boulder, I think, somewhere up there, right? Yeah, I think it was Richard Rohr. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of folks have done it. Yeah. It was interesting that there was somebody. <clears throat> you know, I was going to look it up last night while I'm thinking in bed to get the book, but. I <laughs> well, I remember I, I was taking a class um, in college on Eastern Christianity, so the Eastern Orthodox tradition. And um, there is a strong tradition of breath prayer 
in, in the East. And it was not so much, not so strong. It hasn't been very strong in the West until the sort of centering prayer stuff um, came alive. But my professor was just pointing out, says, yeah, it's been the East, but it had been in India and places like that for a lot longer. But the, 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 the intermingling of Eastern Christians, you know, and the, and the, um, the, the Eastern Orthodox side, whether it's Armenia, or, I mean, they were in contact through trade routes and all of this stuff with all of those folks in ways that the West wasn't. And, and so it, it became very, and a lot of Western Christians don't realize that that breath prayer or this kind of thing is part of Christian tradition, it's just not part of Western Christian tradition. And Pennington and Keating really helped sort of bring it to the West in ways that, that the West hadn't, hadn't paid very close attention to. I, I think the person that really opened up the this to me was Merton. Mer was Merton. And I know I was in college when I read his book, and it was like, oh my goodness gracious, this is more like the way I think. Okay. And um, I, I mean, it was he was just, I think he was right on. <laughs> so I've already um, answered this question. The first question from me, I'm naturally drawn <laughs> to cataphatic. Jim has sort of said that too, but I don't want to put words in his mouth. But uh, what about the rest of you? Is apophatic or cataphatic more centering prayer or something like the Ignatian exercises more appealing to your sense of spirituality and or prayer? Um, and and I mean, in the, in the second question, what appeals to you? What intimidates you? When I was on the uh, standing committee, uh, our chaplain was Michelle Hansen, and she does a lot of centering prayer. So we got a lot of exposure to it. Uh, um, it's interesting, probably just not my cup of tea. Mark? I think I did both. Um, I've had meditation practice for many years, and that was the most intimidating because of my monkey mind. It's only been in the last year that I've been able to forgive myself and get distracted. And that is the key to mastering that center prayer. On, on the other hand, on the uh, Lectio Divinum, you mentioned about a picture. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in the uh, North Carolina Art Museum in Raleigh, and they have a wonderful exhibit of 13th, 14th, 15th century art. And I would sit in one of those pictures and just look at it for 10, 15 minutes doing that exercise that you talked about. And spend all day just it because of that mm -hmm. It kind of relates to the pictures that you have in your sermons. You know, you're, you're talking, and then I look at the pictures, and I, the, the two kind of merge. It's, it's a connection. Okay, good. I read something um, lately, and I don't know where I'm sorry because I've been so many things, but. Um, this person's contention was that that meditation or central prayer is the prayer. The point isn't the point part where you're not distracted. The point is the turning away from the distraction. That's the point of the whole exercise, is the turning away. So if you have to turn away, that's the point. And um, that was like a game changer. I still have a very hard time doing it. It's for a bit of a to distract. Um, that was news to me because I always thought it was the point that you were supposed to be in that place where you weren't distracted. Yeah, you're supposed to just acknowledge it yeah. and then let it go by. And that's the point. Yeah, that's the point. Not to believe yourself. Yeah, it's supposed to be like a it's supposed to be like a cloud <laughs> just <laughs> drifting across the sky. <laughs> no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, the, and the times, this isn't so much about centering prayer specifically, but there is that overlap between sort of mindfulness and centering prayer, that sense of calming. And the times when I, what I find myself is that if I'm listening to, to a meditation, um, you know, a 15 minute meditation or something, usually by minute 10, I'm asleep. <laughs> you know, and maybe that's another reason why I like the cataphatic is I can, you know, I can sort of get in there and I don't, it, it helps engage me. So, um, Jesus enjoyed nature, and I thought, wow, I hadn't thought about that, uh, just like he hadn't thought about it. 
Um, I certainly enjoy nature, but I'd never thought about Jesus enjoying nature, given all, but given all of his images and all of that, he certainly paid attention to it. And it's kind of like going back to the picture of laughing Jesus. Well, it doesn't say Jesus enjoyed nature. Well, it doesn't say Jesus laughed. Well, if he was human, he would have probably done both of those. <laughs> um, and uh, so how do we discover God in creation? And again, this isn't so much a conversation as an experience. How do we experience God in creation? And um, I certainly have read a lot of this that he refers to research says go outside. Go outside, get out of your cubicle, go outside. Um, because it, whether it's different kind of air, non-recirculated air, whether it's feeling the sun or the wind um, or something, it's, it's going to change, change your physiology a little bit in, in, in some ways. Um, and I, I would say, I don't think he really says this, I would say that that, that leads to a sense of wholeness, which is salvation. In, in and of itself, um, it's in its own way. Um, he suggests, you know, let nature calm or delight you. Just go out and let it happen. Um, it, it's that time of year when you see a lot of nature happening. <laughs> and, and watching, as I do, you, you, you know I'm a bird watcher, watching um, hawks, uh, do their courting flights. It's just, it's just, you watch, or eagles, you just, you just watch these, these birds flying in, in concert with each other. And it's just, it's delightful, you know? Um, or, you know, so I, I, I certainly, uh, and, and why can't we experience God in delight? Um, we had a practice yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about what we're doing in May. April's a little too crowded. We'll start it back up in May. And yeah, if you've got some ideas, I'd be happy to hear them. But, uh, um, let nature calm or delight you, uh, and just enjoy it as, as, as evidence of God's creation. Again, enjoyment and delight. These are not words that we often hear connected with prayer. Um, uh, consider nature as an image of God. And that was one that I certainly hadn't thought of. And I can see a lot of people say, uh oh, this is, this is uh, deifying nature. Um, but his, his example of the unimaginable immensity of the sea or the, uh, chaotic, uh, the chaos. Of, of a sea being um, some kind of an image of God, a way of experiencing God, um, I thought was provocative. Thoughts on any of this? Father? Uh, yeah, yeah, Mike. Um, if you go up to C-470 in Kipling, take the exit and go to the Deer Creek Canyon Park, uh -huh. everybody goes there to hike in the foothills. But I'm fortunate that I work on a property that gives me a 180 degree view of the back of the hogback. And every time mm -hmm. I see that, you know, God says, well, Mike, what do you think of this? <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's in the spring, fall, winter, it's just a, uh, an amazing presentation. And it allows that little humble prayer to God saying, Thank you that you give me this greatness of who you are and what you're about. Just looking okay. at a, the back of the hogback, not the foothills. Yeah, those hogbacks are amazing. Absolutely amazing. Go the ahead. Monday Book Club is reading a wonderful book called Breeding Sweet Grass. And, and there's a chapter called The Three Sisters. And The Three Sisters, uh, the author is a Potawatomi, a member of the Potawatomi Nation and a biologist. So she combines the two of them and writes beautifully, great phrases. But the center of the three set sisters is the corn stalk. And the corn stalk provides the stock, a stable for the uh, pole beans, which go around it. And then underneath the corn stalk are squash, pumpkins, 
And in this chapter, she describes at harvest time that the corn, the beans, and the squash are put together in various dishes, but one of them is a soup. <laughs> it's just, it's not so great. But it's this, we, we, we respect the earth. And I always see that as God telling us mm -hmm. to be the husband, you know, husband it. And we don't do that well. But respecting the earth and the earth gives back. And it, so uh, it, it's been a wonderful read. I recommend the book anyway. It's a good read. Need to move along here. We're almost out of time. We're just about done. Um, it goes on other ways of praying with nature. Learn about the wonders of nature. And of course, there was this long piece on there of birds. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but it, they're amazing. They're just they're, they're just absolutely amazing. Any any wild creature that uh, that that you spend any time learning about. Is, is equally as amazing, whether it's snakes or big cats or bears. I mean, just the more you know about these, the more amazed, uh, amazed you are. Um, he says, let nature teach you about God. Um, I had a little book of cartoons. It was all on penguins. And there was one of the cartoons, I, I can't find the little book. I, I run across it about every five years, and I never remember where it is. And, it, and it's this, this cartoon of a penguin with its wings around a tree. It's penguins put their trust in trees, which is, which is a really weird mind bender because penguins would never see trees. So how do you, you know, but anyway, I always think about um, when let nature teach you about God because he talked about a tree and, and what, what trees... If you hug a tree, what does that tell you? Um, you know, depending on the tree, it blows in the wind. It's supple. Could be really a sequoia. I can't get my arms around this. You know, it's just um, teach you about God. Look for epiphanies um, in nature. Well, you just sort of wake up and say, "Wow!" And then, kind of what, what we've already talked about this reverence and care. The more you know, and he referred to to the encyclical Laudato Si. The more you know about um, the earth, the more you might want to care about it. And that's been one of the, the things that stood behind the altars in the world, is that if we go out and we walk up Waterton Canyon, or if we walk down the South Platte, or if we go to these places and we see the birds, or we see the mountain goats, or we see all those things, then we begin to care and we want to make sure that they still have a place. And so that reverence and care for creation, I, I would say, um, certainly puts us in in contact with God. Um, creation was suffused with God's presence for people living in biblical times. Um, what's lost when creation is no longer seen as suffused with God's presence? You turn it into a commodity. Um, <laughs> was, who was it, James Watt? We're all old enough to remember James Watt. Seeing one redwood, you've seen them all. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, ketchup's a vegetable. Let's, uh, let's move on from there. <laughs> are, you, are you able to connect with God in creation? Is this one of those places where you can connect? And I've, I've seen heads go up and down, and I've heard people say yes, that, that that's really... For most everybody, I think, if, if they can get out. I love listening to stories of, of um, people who take inner city kids out up into the mountains or someplace like that when all they've ever seen is concrete and asphalt. And, and you know, the growth and the surprise and all of that that um, the kids experience because they've just never been out in any place where anything is green um, other than, you know, paint. Um, but to see that or to feel the wind and, and all those kinds of things. So um, where does that happen? Yeah, that walk outside. You don't have to go very far. You don't have to go very far. Well, next week we'll wind up. It's Palm Sunday. It's all about green, right? Um, talking about prayer. So he's, he gets into spiritual direction. I saw that various topics. And then he raises the question of now what, which I think is a great place to end as we head into Holy Week and Easter. So we are done. We will be done next week. Um, you know, it's, it, I, I, I noted this when we were, when I finished this last chapter, the chapter on um, 
Looking for We've read 302 pages of this book. <laughs> there you go. That's success. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. Thank you. We'll see you next week. See you, Mike. Now, I'm going to wait for the next go round. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't see you.